Welcome to Presents. I'm your host, Sky McGeehee. We are joined this week by Dr. Marlene Trump, who began her term as the seventh president of Boise State in July of 2019. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Trump. It's a pleasure to have you on. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. Yeah, so how are you adjusting to Boise State and its atmosphere, which I assume is definitely different from that of a UC school? Well, um, I was in the UC for two years, and before that I was at Arizona State, and they've all been really different. I was in Ohio for 15 years before that. So, um, uh, Boise has been amazing. It's one of the most welcoming, warm communities I've ever come to. So it was easy in many ways to make the adjustment to come. And I was excited to be here because it's a place that's really evolving and changing and growing and innovating, innovating and doing all these incredible things. And so it makes it exciting to be here. And so it was a thrill to come and it's been wonderful to land here. It is very different from every place I've ever been. Yeah. I think that's a lot of the draw that brings a lot of people yeah. here too. It's just the people, it's friendlier, it's smaller, just a bunch of different things like that. So what do you love most about the university and like the Boise in general? I think there's two things I would say. One is I love the community feel. Uh, the fact that people are really engaged in and love the university. And I was so struck when I came here. So Phoenix has a pretty big football culture too. Mm -hmm. um, but when the university plays, People in town don't dress in orange and blue like that would never, you know, or, or in their maroon and gold. You know, it's not something people would ever think of doing. And here, the whole you feel the whole community get excited yeah, about a game or, or about an event or about commencement. You know, there's there's already excitement in the air about commencement coming up, yeah. and and so there's a real sense of community on campus and also off, and that's wonderful to experience. Um, the other thing I really love is. That innovation piece that I mentioned earlier, the fact that this is an organization that really is a university that's really thinking about how can we serve our students better? How can we think differently? How can we really do something special? And, and there's an openness to the possibilities of doing things completely differently than anyone else does them, and I love that. Yeah, having a lot of um, room for improvement and change is really exciting. Mm -hmm. um, how do you feel your small town or rural roots have helped you negotiate uh, not only the school and city's social climate, but also like the more rural areas of Idaho? Well, uh, you know, I feel like I, I understand the people who live in those places in a way that I think a lot of people wouldn't. And, you know, when, <clears throat> uh, when I first arrived and there were people who were saying, oh, she came here from California. Gee, I was in California for two years. I grew up in like Wyoming. Really. Yeah. <laughs> and, and a lot of people, when they learned I was from Wyoming, in fact, I had a funny experience at the Garth Brooks concert I had um, a legislator in in the suite that I have, and um, he said, you know, my family had a Western store in Green River, Wyoming, um, a number of years ago, and I said, oh yeah, Corral Western store, and he was like so blown away, and I actually, the cowboy boots I was wearing were from Corral West, <laughs> and, and he was like, are you serious? And I said, yeah, and I said, these came from that store, and it just <laughs> blew his mind. And I think it's almost like people had to, like, re-remember over and over again that I grew up in this yeah. small town in Wyoming. But I think it does give me a sense of understanding and a sense of commitment to people from all over the state, you know? Um, I think, I really feel like Boise State should serve the state of Idaho and the people of Idaho. And that includes both people in this exciting metropolitan area and the rest of the people across the rest of the state. There's definitely some very rural areas. Mm -hmm. um, so I know that you have some programs to help them. How can you explain that just a little bit more? Like how are you the reaching? Rural students? Yeah, how are you reaching? We have them? such a cool program um, that we're launching for next year. So uh, when I was in Arizona, I launched a program there where we reached out to a small community that was underserved by the university. And Phoenix is a really big metro area. It's the sixth largest city in the country. But there's a lot of rural areas in Arizona, just like in Idaho. So we reached out to this rural community and we said, is there anything you need in your community? And they said, we could really use a degree program in education here so that we can educate our own people to be educators so that folks who understand the community stay here and teach. Right. And, and so we worked with the College of Education to build a degree that we delivered there in the community for the people in that community at their request, and it was extremely successful. And so we're on, working on the same project right now with three communities here in Idaho, rural communities in Idaho, and we're so excited about the prospect of being able to go to these communities and say, what do you need? Yeah. 
and let us come to you. Be more yes, yes. And you know, you think about the world we live in right now, everything we do is so tailored. Mm -hmm. And if we can serve these communities better by reaching out to them and understanding them better, think how different that a model that is than you come to us. Right. and figure it out when you get here yeah. for us to go to them. So I'm excited personal, about that program. That more personal touch. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. That's a very good thing to have, I think. Um, how are you working to make Boise State a better place, not just for students, but also for staff and faculty? I'm so committed to that. I really think when I talked about the value of community, um, for me, that's one of the highest priorities there is. So that means taking care of the students, but it also means taking care of the staff and faculty. So what we're doing for staff right now is I've met with both the professional staff leadership and ACE, the classified staff leadership, mm -hmm. and I've heard the concerns that they have, and I'm working with our HR office to actually build programs to support people and be responsive to those concerns and needs. So we're really actively working on that. And one of the things I'm really interested in is figuring out how do we recognize the amazing things people are doing on a daily basis? Because right. I know students, for example, you know, they might walk into an office and interact with a staff person who just makes their life so much easier. Mm -hmm. And wouldn't it be great if you could walk out of that meeting and recognize that person instantly on your phone? Right. And so we're trying to think about ways that we can make sure that people also get to hear that positive feedback, but we're gonna work really hard to make sure the programs are set up to support them as well. For faculty, what we're thinking about is how do we reorganize our Office of Research so that we can really support faculty research in a way that's energizing and supportive and meaningful for them. But we're also working to ask them, how do you want to work together? And what are the obstacles that exist right now? In, in most universities, um, there's a very traditional model of how to do things. And Boise State isn't bound by that. Already, there's been so much innovation right. here. But we went out to the faculty, I went and met with all the colleges and I said, are there places right now where you can see either policies or structures that are undermining your ability to do the great work you wanna do? Mm -hmm. And so they've been letting us know what those things are and we're working at them one by one. And I really think it can be transformative, especially, you know, we're seeing already um, the state talking about having to be more cautious with the budget mm -hmm. this year and what that's going to mean for us that could be you know that could mean it's painful yeah. cuts for us so it's especially important for us to think about the working conditions that everybody is experiencing so that we can even while we have to be responsive to the state that we can also still be taking care of our community somehow find a compromise between those two mm -hmm. um, what's your goal for BSU's future or how would you like to what would you like to see happen or change here well what i'd like to do is I just met with a group of faculty this morning that are um, working on projects across the university to help students better articulate the value of their degree. Mm -hmm. So what you're learning, how can you talk about that with a potential employer? Right. How can you talk about what you've learned to do? The kind of work you're doing right now is easily translatable, right? Like somebody's gonna be able to see how that might impact your ability to do a job. Right. But for some people that's harder. They might, and, and that's in any field, even a field that we think of as being really valuable, like a STEM field. You know, how does a chemist talk about what they've learned when mm -hmm. they're applying for a job, say at Dow Chemical? Right. So how can we help students do that better? This group of amazing faculty are working on that. And they're working all across the university in all sorts of ways. And one of the things that I said to them this morning is, I don't want you to take other great universities around the country as your model because what you're doing is so innovative and so forward thinking it's and so creative. Don't model yourself on what's out there. And in 15 years, everybody's gonna come to us and ask us how we're doing it. Yeah, so that the plan is really to accelerate that innovation and support that innovation so that our faculty and staff who are doing all these incredibly creative things, that we make more of that possible and we become the national leaders. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's a great way to do it, is sort of forge your own path instead of trying to um, copy what somebody else has done. Yeah. Um, kind of switching gears a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, former President Bob Kustra built a legacy of change at this university. How do you feel you are supporting or changing his legacy or that legacy? Mm -hmm. um, what Dr. Kustra did is he came in and he said, we're gonna move forward and, and really become an innovative university. And a lot of people don't know we're nationally ranked for innovation. There are thousands of universities 
and colleges in this country, there are hundreds that are classified as what are called national universities. Mm -hmm. And we're ranked number 42 in the entire nation for innovation. So he really brought us a long mm -hmm. way and he really advanced the research enterprise. So what I'll be doing is building on the work that he did. And because I came up through the academic ranks, you know, I was a professor. Because I came up through the academic ranks, I really understand the pedagogy, the part, you know, how do you teach? How does that integrate with your research? How do you advance research? I understand that in a way that's different mm -hmm. from somebody who doesn't come up through that side. And there are levers I can pull to advance that work that I think will be really exciting. And one of our deans, for example, in arts and sciences, which is usually the biggest college on, or the, yeah, the biggest college on any university campus, mm -hmm. um, she's thinking about how can people be organized, not just in departments, but in thematic schools, mm -hmm. so that people across those fields are supporting each other. Right. That's a really innovative way of thinking. Yeah, it's better to support each other that way inter internally, mm -hmm. for sure. And if you've got scientists who are talking to engineers, who are talking to health scientists, who are talking to educators, and you've got all those folks engaged with each other, you're gonna come up with different solutions to complex problems than people who are working in little silos. And trying to figure out their, those skills on their own and trying mm -hmm. to make something out of that. Mm -hmm. Um, in one of your initial interviews, you mentioned Boise State's growth over the past years. Uh, it's certainly true the university has experienced a lot of growth, and some worry that just like the city of Boise's infrastructure, the school doesn't have resources necessary to support the rapid uh, growth and change, and that some specialized programs may be stretched increasingly thin. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how would you like to see this resolved? Well, I think um, part of that is that innovative thinking that we've been talking mm -hmm. about. So um, we are growing fast, and so far, um, what we've done is, is institutionally we've been incredibly creative on the student support side with our teaching, building the structures to advance the university. So we've been incredibly creative and innovative and I think that's what we'll continue to have to do. And sometimes I've watched universities um, make really interesting changes and there's a program at UCLA right now that's very, very interesting. Um, it's very difficult for universities to hire enough uh, mental health counselors to serve a student population Absolutely. because uh, it's hard to get people to come into that environment to work in that and commit to working in that environment it's high demand um, it's intense and so you know there are people who'd rather not so you we're all competing for those same folks who are really who really care about mm -hmm. this population and so UCLA did something really creative they created a structure where they have peer support networks, mm -hmm. and those peer supporters are trained for a whole year before they are they set out to support peers. And then they have a second layer of peer support. So those are people who train for a year and then have experience for at least a year. Mm -hmm. and, and they reach out to the whole campus and say, is anyone here experiencing depression or anxiety? People have to fill out a little inventory. And then when they find those people, if the problems aren't serious, like somebody went like, oh gosh, I didn't do as well on this test as I want to, and now I'm not sure what I'm gonna do, I feel freaked out, I don't mm -hmm. know how to tell my parents. That's probably a tier one problem that if you have a peer who can say to you, hey, everybody's had that experience. It's, great. You're it's fine. totally yeah. normal, right? It's okay mm -hmm. to be freaked out. Let's talk to an advisor. Let's make sure you get you know, a chance to look at everything. Let's also talk to your professor, like someone who can give mm -hmm. you that sort of uh, senior peer advice, like someone who's got a little more experience. And then the tier two, those more experienced peer advisors might be meeting with someone who's got a little more serious anxiety, mm -hmm. like, I don't know what I'm doing with my life. And then somebody who's seriously depressed or anxious, that person sees the professional staff. Right. And it allows that professional staff to focus on those folks instead of people having to wait in line for so long. Yeah, definitely. That's a really innovative way to give the experience who are those peer advisors, to give them a professional experience that could be life transforming for them, and to get people help in a quicker fashion, mm -hmm. and to make sure that the people who are the professionals are the ones who are seeing the most serious cases. Yeah. So that's an innovative structure that solves a problem of not being able to hire enough counselors fast enough. Mm -hmm. So I think there are ways in which we can be really responsive to needs on our campus by throwing out the rule book and saying, what are some ways, and it's not always gonna be a peer solution, right. but what are ways, is, are there technological solutions? So one of the things I saw at another university is that um, 
there's a technology that tracks every single student on every single major map in the university. Okay. And if you either fail a class or don't take a class that you need for your major in that semester, it alerts your academic advisor and you and says, you need to talk to your advisor. It's just so that the advisor can make sure, have you changed your mind about your major? Mm -hmm. um, are you aware that you need to take this class or you right. won't graduate on time? Um, and then that person can give some information and they can get have an information exchange, but it's sort of like a, a red flag that flies up to let people know if there's a problem. That's a brilliant technological solution when there's no way people can be going through every single person's record every single day. Yeah. It's just the volume is too great. Keeps people from falling behind. Yeah, and from falling through the cracks. Mm -hmm. And so there might be creative solutions that we have to deploy to make sure that we're still keeping our infrastructure in shape as we grow. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we'll find those because this is the kind of place that does that kind of innovation. Yeah, definitely. We definitely have a lot of room that we can change things and manipulate them. Mm -hmm. um, so I know you have a quite, excuse me, I know you have quite an active social media presence. <laughs> um, speaking in terms of media manipulation and production, how do you feel about required media literacy courses? I think the faculty really um, need to be a part of a conversation about any course that's required. Right. And they need to be really assessing what what are the needs of our students. And students should be involved in that conversation as well, talking about what they feel like they need. What's clear to me is that, that our nation needs to have better media liter literacy. Absolutely. Um, uh, we understand now different ways that media is trying to manipulate us. When I was young, um, the only thing people thought about was advertising. Right. Now we have all these other venues at which information is coming at us and often presenting itself as fact. You know, even, mm -hmm. if, even if you flip through a magazine now, there are ads, but they're, they look like they're stories until you get down to the small print that tells you it's an ad. Yeah, they can barely see. <laughs> yeah, and so um, the, there are things that have really changed and transformed. And I think actually our students are quite savvy and it's partly because they've grown up with a lot of right. it. Um, you know, I look at my son who's 17 and I think how keenly aware he is mm -hmm. of those kinds of things. Whereas a lot of people my age don't recognize when something that's um, an attempt to persuade them is presented as just fact. Right. And so they're not as canny about that. Um, so maybe, maybe you know, 15, 60 year olds need it more than <laughs> Than college, students. than college students, but I think that there are bigger and bigger questions on the horizon, mm -hmm. and and you know I'll, I I'll give you a specific example of this. My son, when he realized I had an Instagram account, which I've had for a really really long <laughs> time, he went through my Instagram account and he came to he came up to my room and he said, I want you to take down these pictures of me <laughs> that are on your Instagram account. You know they're from when he was little yeah. and stuff like that, and and. I said, oh really, I love these pictures. And he was like, he said, I'm curating my social media presence. <laughs> <laughs> I need you to do this for me, yeah. please. <laughs> so, you know, there's a, there's a canniness and savviness that I mm -hmm. think younger people have that a lot of older people don't. Definitely. And, um, but I do think as the world continues to evolve, we all need literacy, mm -hmm. whether it's digital or print or, or just cultural literacy. Yeah. We all need literacy, so I don't ever think literacy is out of step. Right, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so do you feel like, or do you, excuse me, do you feel that things like basic video and edit audio, ex oh my gosh, excuse me, do you feel like things like basic audio and video editing or um, recording, photography and social media skills are necessary in the digital age? It's hard to say how that's going to evolve. Mm -hmm. I know. You know, we're in a moment right now where so much of all of that's done on people's phones. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you, you know, when you look at some of the things people put up, especially on Instagram, um, the creativity and beauty of what people do in a minute right. on their phone, like they take an image and they manipulate it. There's so much savviness about that right now. And a lot of the things that, you know, I first learned when I was first studying photography. I did it in a dark room. Mm -hmm. right? That's just not even something that we imagine doing anymore unless we're doing it for artistic reasons. Right. And so artists still do it. And sometimes people do it when they're trying to really hone a craft of photography so that they can understand those historic modes and how it influences right. their thinking. Um, but it's more of an art form than a practical practice now. Right. So I'm, it's hard to say how much 
of, of that is going to be something that we need to train and how much of it is going to be people learning it through their own technology right, that they own. carry with them. And, and, but I do think it's critical. I just think how it's going to map out is going to be hard to predict. And so right now it's still important for people who want to navigate that landscape to do it. What's it going to look like in 10 years? Right, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. It's hard. It's hard to predict stuff like that. Well, it's moving so fast right mm -hmm. now. The world's changing so quickly. Somebody called it the fourth industrial revolution at a talk that I was at. So the, the fourth time we've had mm -hmm. a massive burst of change. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. That's a good way of looking at it, yeah. I think. Um, finally, I wanted to ask you about your background in 19th century culture and literature. Mm -hmm. um, what important parallels can you draw between then and now? Uh, actually, I've just named one. Okay. So they went through an industrial revolution. Right. <laughs> and, and we're seeing, and they went through this incredibly rapid pace of change. And part of what that rapid change does is it makes all the things you thought you understood about the world around you, it kind of throws them up in the mm -hmm. air. And we're seeing that again right now. What, and, you know, what are the relationships between different groups of people and the roles that people have and what do those mean? And, and um, how do the structures that we have in place either accommodate or fail to accommodate the things we think are important? And, and so as time moves on in this mo moment of really dramatic change, um, we're asking a lot of really big cultural questions, and that's part of the reason I think there's so much cultural conflict right yeah, now. Yeah, definitely. And, and it's become really polarizing, sadly. You know, people aren't talking to each other as much as they used to. Yeah. Um, but I think the 19th century is a great way to understand those kinds of processes and those kinds of really important tensions, but without the baggage of being in that cultural moment where people have their own political commitments already. Right. And so it's more detached from those, and people can be better analysts sometimes. And then you can take that understanding and apply it to the current cultural moment, and that can be really um, a powerful way to study your own moment differently. OK, well, so my next question was, um, what lessons do you think we can learn from those parallels? Um, are there any others? Like, you kind of already listed them, I feel like. Well, one of the things I'm really interested in right now, so I'm writing a book on unsolved murder cases from the 19th century. That's fascinating. It's super yeah, interesting. Yeah, really interesting. Or cases that were really belatedly solved. OK. And, and part of what I'm asking is, in this moment where there was this boom in technology about how we uh, um, investigated and adjudicated crimes. Mm -hmm. So that's when fingerprinting gets developed. That's when blood analysis gets developed. All these things right. that emerge. Um, uh, all different kinds of, that's when forensic science as a field was born. Okay. So um, when we look at those cases and we see the things that are so obvious to us now that are gaps, like, gosh, why didn't they think of that? For example, um, there was only one female Jack the Ripper suspect. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. And she committed a couple of really, really grisly murders really? before the Jack the Ripper murders. Um, and it, people, the police didn't suspect her because she was a woman. Right, of course. Just it was just like, that. of course, yeah. right. It was like a woman could never commit this grisly crime. And she not only murdered people, but she um, manipulated their bodies in ways that were really alarming. Just really gruesome, yeah. terrible murders. Yes, yes. And so the police didn't think a woman was capable of that. It wasn't until they walked into her blood-drenched kitchen oh my that they figured it out. So for me, looking at those kinds of cases, and mm -hmm. sometimes it gives me nightmares when I read that stuff, you know, it's yeah, serious. De yeah, business. definitely. Um, looking at those cases can help us ask questions about how are we investigating and adjudicating crime right now? Because there's a lot of tension about that in our culture. Mm -hmm. You know, are, do we give people who are accused of a crime a fair chance? Are we investigating thoroughly certain kinds of crimes or not? I mean, there's all this tension about mm -hmm. that right now. And there's a really similar moment in the 19th century. And now we have DNA testing. And I'll give you a specific example about DNA. Um, there was this fascinating case where um, a man, uh, there was DNA found at a crime scene where a man was murdered. Mm -hmm. And the person who was, whose DNA was found um, was like, I wasn't there. I had nothing to do with this. Mm -hmm. But the DNA evidence was so solid right. that he was convicted and sent to prison. And his attorney, he didn't have an alibi. Right. And his attorney was just so convinced he was not the perpetrator that she kept researching and researching and researching. And what she found is that um, this 
uh, the mur man who was murdered, mm -hmm. they clipped a pulse ox. Do you know what that device is? Mm -hmm. It's where it's this little clip they put on your finger to oh, take your mm -hmm. um, pulse and your oxygen levels in your blood. They clipped a pulse ox on his finger, and they realized that his finger had scraped the inside of the pulse ox when they had put his finger in, and that's where the DNA had collected. And it was wow. the DNA from this other man who had had the pulse ox clipped on his finger earlier that day. That's so weird. And a little bit of DNA had remained. So the forensic science wasn't incorrect, mm -hmm. but it was the wrong reading yeah. of the data that was there. Yeah, I don't know how you'd prevent that though. Like how, how do you? It really requires a deeper analysis. Mm -hmm. And so what the case I'm making in my book is that we can't just go, oh, data, data, done. Right. We have to look at the full complex picture, and that means reading other things besides the science. So in the 19th century, they were dealing with those things too, with all the new technologies. And now we're in this moment of DNA testing and people feeling like, well, there's the answer to all solving all crimes. That's it, that's all there is to it. Right, right. and it's more complex than that, just like it was then. Huh. That's really interesting. True crime really fascinates me, so I'd love to talk to you more about that. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, though, that is all the time we have for today. Thank you again to Dr. Marlene Trump for coming onto the show. I'm your host, Sky McGeehee, and this has been Presents.